and I interview a lot of people who were doing alternative agriculture. So I would propose alternative ways of doing the same thing that the chemicals do. But uh, frankly, they rarely, that is my colleagues, rarely listen to me. And one of the issues that really struck me almost violently was what I discovered after I moved to the EPA. I discovered that the EPA had been trying to do something about laboratories that were actually faking science. They were faking data. Uh, the classic example of that, uh, of that reality was a laboratory outside of Chicago with the name of Industrial Biotest Laboratory. It became massive, a gigantic laboratory that tested up to 40, 40 percent of all chemicals in the country, including pesticides and drugs. And chemical industry knew about its friendly ways, so they were testing their chemicals and the chemicals were always getting an A+. Plus. So they were approved by the government agencies, that is EPA, USDA, or the natural, or the um, uh, US Drug Administration, Food and Drug Administration. And of course, as part of that, they became part of the diet of the Americans, eat, they eat, therefore they eat pesticides, they eat all the stuff that this, this industry uh, did and approved. <clears throat> and it, it's remarkable because the man who discovered the fraud, and for 10 years I kept talking to him and he kept talking to me, he gave me everything, all the memoranda he ever written, and it was just a horrendous story of corruption that the industry, that is in the companies like Monsanto, Syngenta, they would go there with an extensive list of chemicals to be tested. The, the laboratory would do it and they fake most of the data and then they take the data to the government agencies and the government agencies would approve their products. So once EPA discovered the fraud, rather than withdraw the products that had been tested falsely and criminally almost, the government found this excuse that we have alternative studies and therefore we don't need to remove this stuff from the market. But they did not really have alternative studies. Now, why should we be concerned about pesticides? After all, the, um, <clears throat> the experts say that the minute amounts of the stuff ever gets into our food and therefore why should we be concerned? Let me explain. During World War I, the Allies, that is the Germans and the Austrians fought against the French and the Americans and all this, and they fought a chemical warfare. They used chlorine and other gases to kill each other, and they did. So World War II comes, and they had massive amounts of these chemicals already created, neurotoxins, but they did not use them. So after the World War II came to an end, they passed all this stuff to the farmers, because they said that it's efficient to kill an insect very fast and no problem. They, they, and they began to do all the studies that I mentioned before to legitimize the use of neurotoxins in agriculture. So these are the kind of issues that I was raising with my colleagues at EPA. I would write memoranda and say the history of this chemical goes back to World War I and World War II. So why would we have the audacity and the madness to allow this stuff to get into people's food? But because we use these chemicals in agriculture, because the American farmer has industrialized everything, honeybee cannot find a place to eat. And if it finds something to eat, it has been sprayed, and it's a neurotoxin, then the insect gets dazed, cannot find its way back to its hive, so it freezes to death or it dies outside of its hive. And if it manages to get into its hive and it, it has on its hind legs some neurotoxin, then the, all the honeybees will in the, in the hive most likely will die. And in the United States, we have a, a tragedy of almost wiping out our honeybees. They kept passing on to me all these memoranda for them, them describing the ugly situation with honeybees starting in the mid-70s. They were recommended to their superiors that we should ban or at least put a moratorium on the use of this parathion type of chemicals and they, ex they expressly told them that uh, they had pictures to show piles of dead bees all over the country. They were going to Wyoming and Illinois and California and bringing back the evidence. But their superiors, because of their political connections with the congressmen and companies, they expanded the use of these chemicals to the point that 
we are facing the tragedy of most likely losing our honeybees. It's the agricultural system that is at fault here. We have a <clears throat> our metaphysics are completely screwed up. We assume that we can dominate the natural world. We put too many corn plants next to each other, then we spray them and all modify the genetic stuff of life within the corn so that the whole corn becomes a poison. So the insect goes there to eat something and dies. And then the birds don't have to eat insects, they die. So it's a chain of evil that it continues to, to really hurt this, uh, the economy and the society of this country. I have met young women that they have found glyphosate in their breast milk. And one of them, in fact, has created a kind of moms across America to bring mothers, young mothers, uh, to notify them, to inform them that this is what's going on. So they all stop eating conventional food, so they begin to eat organic food, so that at least they can diminish the harm. And you don't spend money on people that actually indirectly poison you. In, they do it indirectly through the food. And of course, when you spray something and it rains, most likely that poison will go into the drinking water at least the groundwater that sometimes becomes drinking water and therefore you have two sources. You have the groundwater and you have the food. And these chemicals also, there's some interesting thing that happens. Once you drop a poison by a helicopter, only 0.1% will ever reach the target, let's say, to kill uh, an insect that you don't like. 99% or more will actually become part of this stream and it will go around the globe. And it will come down with rain, with mist, with fog, snow, all of this will come down. So, in a sense, not only we hurt ourselves directly, but we hurt the natural world. So we have birds that get cancer, we have wildlife that gets cancer and other disease, and uh, fish die by the millions, because if the farmer in Iowa sprays let's say glyphosate, and it rains, all this stuff will get into the, into the rivers, and the river, of course, is full of fish, and would, most of the fish will die. So we, we are hurting ourselves, and we are hurting our future, our children, our grandchildren. They will actually be hurt by this. And, and so for all these reasons, it seems to me, we need to rethink about the whole industrial mode of food production, and encourage organic farmers to the extent to replace this conventional food system, get rid of all these chemicals that are causing the harm, and maybe think even redistributing land. Do you think EPA did this? I mean, you know, <clears throat> why, why? EPA is not, I mean, you cannot really point your finger and blame the EPA as an organization. It's a fantastic organization. It was founded by Richard Nixon, a Republican. Now, EPA, if left alone, without political concern, they would do a good job because they have the trained people. They have literally hundreds of people with PhDs in all disciplines of science. The problem with EPA is that the White House and Congress interferes. Uh, if um, the industry gets some problematic answer from EPA scientists that your product may be causing all sorts of adverse effects, they go straight to the White House or they go to their congressman or senator. The congressman or senator will begin to call up the EPA administrator and the EPA administrator knows that he works at the pleasure of the president and if he's likely to say, just speed up the process, stop messing up and with two weeks you get your answer, you get your approval for your chemical. And it happens with all presidents, Democrats and Republicans. When I was there for 25 years, I did not see any substantive change or difference between Republicans and Democrats. But behind all this wonderful rhetoric, they work with the congressmen and senators who want to see this stuff used in industry and spread and continue to do business as usual. So you're saying that uh, there's a link between industry and Congress? Definitely. There's a, this is no doubt. There's little doubt about that. Their organizations, they have, in fact, they can they have monitored the money that the congressmen and senators receive from all these uh, industrial uh, agents, especially the people that call themselves lobbyists, lobbying, lobbyists, and they get the money, they go out to lunch and so on. When I used to work for this congressman from Maryland, he's, he died a long time ago, <laughs> he, we had people coming to our office all the time. 
and they would even ask me and other staff members to be taken out to lunch and dinner and so on. And of course, I always refused. In fact, the same thing happened at EPA. EPA has a what they call an ethical program that is approved by the ethics officer that industry money will fund you, EPA says that, to send you to Senegal, to send you to Hawaii for a seminar where the industry people will be able to sell their goods to you. And they're going to give you a card and then two weeks later we'll go to you say, hey, hello, Dr. Valianatos, do you remember me? We met at this exclusive hotel. <laughs> well, when I worked for the government, we weren't allowed to take anything. And I had, you know, I worked in the State Department and you know, like some Bangladeshi people gave me some things and uh, I, you know, I couldn't offend them so I gave them something back of equal value, but it was tormentuous because somebody gave me a $20 gift. We're not allowed to take it. Yeah. The federal uh, government, we're not allowed. Yeah. We're not supposed to take any gifts, but they are legally, they can actually do fund you a trip to universities or laboratories or other countries and this is the the time that industry has the opportunity to lobby and to convince these people that their programs are correct. I was at hundreds of meetings where the industry agents would come to EPA and we would get in a nice room and the lobbyist would be nicely dressed with a suit and he would have a PowerPoint presentation with slides and all the my stuff, I mean my colleagues would sit down like good graduate students take notes and they will politely ask questions as if this guy was a professor <laughs> and several times I interrupted the presentation I said I just raised questions that were very unco I felt very uncomfortable with the, what I used to hear from these presentations and from my readings I knew that the, some of what they were telling the EPA staff was not right was not correct so even my EPA colleagues sometimes scolded me for abrupting for abrupt or interrupting the discussion with this distinguished people that were coming from the industry and I would tell them these are lobbyists they're not coming here to inform you they're coming here to convince you that you need to do whatever they are requesting and asking this you, is politics this do you is, think the Congress are corrupt that they're taking money do they realize they're doing anything wrong or are they just stupid I think they realize exactly what they're doing they're not stupid. They're very smart people. <laughs> they want money to be re-elected. And they spend most of their money, most of their time raising money rather than helping to their constituents, so to speak. And it's it's pretty obvious. It has been it's a history of this corruption for decades now. So I yes, I am for changes in the industry and the government, but it seems to me the main change will have to come for people like us. Eating organic food that tells you the stay, sends the message straight to the horse's mouth. You know, we're not going to eat your conventional food. I don't care how much you produce, we're not going to eat it. It seems to me the real, <clears throat> the real power behind all this, and I, I I'm not, uh, I, I don't try to talk about conspiracies, but it seems to me there's definitely a drive to control the world's food supply. If you control the world's food supply, you are the greatest winner on earth. It, uh, controlling the food supply of a people is far more powerful than having guns and setting occupying armies and everything else. I'm a farmer in Canada. Well, repeat the story though, because I'm this, cutting myself out. Yeah, the uh, <clears throat> the farmer Smizer. I don't remember, unfortunately, his correctly the name, but he. I heard him in a, in a conference at um, the University of Texas, <clears throat> and he said he was growing his own food and a neighbor was growing a Monsanto um, copyrighted uh, seed that was blown by the wind into his farm and these agents came there and they grabbed the seed and they went to court and they had to argue that uh, the court in fact sided with Monsanto and told this guy to pay money to Monsanto because he supposedly illegally used these private seeds to benefit. So to speak. So there's a tremendous controversy, a conflict between these privately owned seeds with farmers. And once the farmers follow that path that is relying on certified seeds by a company, plus the chemicals that come with that cow, with that seed, that is the the genetically modified stuff, then they are no longer farmers. They become the serfs of the chemical industry. 
And that's part of the big picture I said before, that it's the whole effort is the whole effort is to control the world's food supply. This is happening, that is the you need to go back to the farmer, I mean to the company to buy the seeds for the next season. You cannot save some of the seeds that from after harvesting your crop. They say you're not you cannot do it, you have to come back to me. Buy my seeds again. Buy with the, the chemical in the chemical stuff that relies. The, in other words, these seeds can do what they do only with the chemicals that the farmer has to buy from the company, and therefore you become dependent entirely on this company. Therefore, you lose your private, you lose your rights of actually doing something for yourself. Doesn't the U.S. government get this? Why is the U.S. government turning a blind eye? I don't know. I, I have no answer to that. But it seems to me they know about that and uh, I remember when I first started in, at EPA I did some historical investigation of the US Department of Agriculture and it looked to me like after World War II this is where fundamental changes took place up to 1945 for us, in the forest the US Department of Agriculture used to support small family farmers after all that was what uh, President Lincoln created the Department of Agriculture he called it the People's Department Legislation changed by the 80s to the point that most of the money that the government uses to subsidize farming goes to a handful of gigantic farmers or companies. So we're, dealing, we're talking about 25 billion per year that goes to these gigantic companies rather than to the small scale farmers in Missouri and Illinois and California to the small family farmers. Indeed, I said, I said I'm astonished I'm at the Land Grant University. Maryland, University of Maryland is a land grant university. And I said, you professors at this land grant university, you don't want to use the term family farmer? What's, what's, what's going on? And they said, you know, if we do that, that suggests that our work up to now is to, for nothing. Because we are supporting the gigantic farmers and we want them to thrive. We want to prevent, we want to deal with ecosystems. But politely, they ignore the excrement from millions of chickens very close to the University of Maryland that ended up in the, in the bay and killed most of the fish. And it still does. We're talking about the Chesapeake Bay in Maryland and Virginia. All that they ignore completely because it was coming out of gigantic chicken farms. <laughs> and this is the this is what the land grant universities have become today. They have become the servants of these gigantic organizations, the universities, that call themselves land grant universities, which are funded by you and me. <laughs> I mean, American citizens are supporting these universities. Well, FISH, the whole uh, department or program on solid waste, was a mess. I mean, I remember times that. Um, uh, senior officials and people I knew, they would be talking about uh, um, haulers of waste at night in big trucks. They would open the valve from the big truck and they would release the stuff in ditches and they would just go on rather than bury this stuff properly so it would not end up in somebody's drinking water or a lake or a river. So this kind of criminal activity went on extensively. Well, the, the people, the people I'm talking to you right now, they were EPA officials. They were senior people, and we were discussing all this um, privately. I mean, in, in conference rooms, and we were thinking what to do. I mean, you needed a police action. These people were criminals. I mean, they were literally violating all laws in the book, but they were doing it secretly. In Louisiana. And those students from Baton Rouge were telling me that, I said, Professor, <laughs> after 8 p.m., that's where the crime begins. I said, what crime? They said, at after 8 p.m., the people with the factories, the, meaning petroleum refineries and incinerators and other factories that were lining the Mississippi River, they would release their waste into the river directly. Now, Mississippi River happens to drain 47% of the country. And a lot of people getting very sick uh, where it's going, too. 47%. Now, all the stuff for the farmers, the extra fertilizers, pesticides, and so on, gets into the Mississippi River and goes into the Gulf of Mexico. What happens? That stuff 
kills or creates algae in the water. They use oxygen. Now, without oxygen, the fish cannot survive. So we have a gigantic area in the Gulf of Mexico that is without oxygen. Therefore, everything is dead. We have what they call dead zones in the Gulf of Mexico, gigantic ones. So you cannot fish, but there's nothing, no fish, nothing. No oxygen because of the stuff of the farmers that the, the Mississippi River brings down to the Gulf of Mexico. That's another deadly consequence of having these gigantic farms and the irresponsible farmers who don't want to pay money to protect the water of the river. And these are all connected, all connected. And the officials know about these things. I'm not telling you anything new, really. These people, there are people in Mississippi everywhere, they know what's going on, but they're terrified. They're not going to talk about it. Terrified of what? They're terrified of the industry. They're terrified of the people who run the government in Mississippi, in Louisiana, because those guys rely for money from the industry to be elected and re-elected and be re-elected. Most of the stuff that the farmers use becomes airborne and it comes down everywhere. New York City, no matter where you live, you're going to get it because it rains and you have the snow and, and it comes down and it's going to harm you. So, and then there's another extraordinary event in all this. The medical establishment is silent. The doctors say nothing. And I have talked to pediatricians and I have talked to physicians. I said, what, what, what's going on with you? Oh, I said, what can we do now? We work in a big hospital and a university and all this. And I said, what about uh, reading stuff that was already in the literature and training your medical students in all this stuff? The medical students don't learn much about nutrition, don't learn much about toxicology, so they cannot identify the stuff that the person may, be, may die, lose his life because of what the exposure he has. Indeed, the first thing that happened, without know, the helicopter spraying and all this, and it was at that seminar that I discovered anything about these neurotoxins. I was so astonished. I wrote a lengthy memorandum to the, a woman, the deputy director of, of the division I used to work, and I said to her, doctor or whatever her name, I said, look, this is what's going on. I said, these chemicals are forbidden by the 1925 Geneva Convention. And we're using them? Of course, she never responded to my memo. She never said a word. She knew me personally, and, and uh, in fact, we danced together and all this. She never said anything at all. It was forbidden territory when you get to this kind of chemicals that are related to war that we actually have allowed our farmers to use. So if you put together that plus what farmers do and the effects on the air, the effects on water, the dead zones that I spoke before, the contamination of, uh, of food and the the impact of all these chemicals on increasing disease. Look at cancer. The cancer has become an epidemic. So where is this cancer coming from? It's not passed through genes. It's coming from the air we breathe, the food we eat and the water we drink. And the difference of the doctors to me is completely, 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 how to put it, immoral. The, in the last chapter of the book, what I did, I looked at small size of farms. You see, one of the arguments of the economists is that the larger the farm, the more productive it becomes. And that's, of course, an illusion. The real facts are the following. If you have a five acre farm that you grow, let's say onions, for instance, five acres, 10 acres, 50 acres. If you look at the productivity of this units of land, the smaller almost is equal to the larger, sometimes even more productive. And not only that, but it uses less poison. We assume in this comparison that all these people use chemicals. The larger is less efficient and uses more poison. So a person buying an onion from a 50 acre farm, he, will, he or she will eat more poison. If you buy it from a small, you get less. And this, but aside from the poisons question, the the importance of this kind of study, and it was done at, with EPA money from a professor at Michigan State University, 
is that it, it nullifies all these arguments that we need to have these gigantic farms in order to produce more food, more efficiently, to feed the world, and so on and so on. Well, the, the, when a scientist writes a memo, he or she would not tell you straightforward what this person, he or she will analyze the situation very carefully, and he will hint at what's going on. And then what I did after reading this, this documents carefully, I would talk to the person because they gave it to me. And they would provide even more data, more, more memos. And I would collaborate one with the other. The case of Hannibal is a classic example of that. <clears throat> in 1976, we had this parathion, and in the 90s, in, later, we had this neonicotinoids. But the same stuff, but different companies, different, but the same effects on the honeybees. And uh, they, the, that's it. I mean, the, the scientists are not, they are very good people. They have the knowledge that they, but they also worry about their families, about their promotion the people that work at the EPA or other government agencies. And I'm not going to brag about me, did it because I was exceptional, but simply I could not stand the ethical version of this. It just bothered the hell out of me. I could not. I said, if I'm going to live, I mean, I'm not a rich person. If they fire me, I don't know what to do. And I had two children, but I balanced this. I said, this is it. I have only one life, life to live. And I'm not going to go in bed with these people in order to be promoted to just 14, 15, you don't poison a society in order to, to benefit three or four people under the illusion and the fraud that this stuff is actually good for producing more food, for doing all these so things. It sounds like the corporations are running the whole show. Yes, indeed. I would say these are the new kind of medieval uh, landlords. Uh, I mean, we are returning back to a kind of a dark age, but we don't really see darkness because we think we have the scientists and medical doctors and all this, and we think that we, we have the truth, we have all this technology, all this sophisticated stuff, we've been to the moon and so on, so it's what the Greeks used to call hubris, hubris. Hubris, yeah. Yeah, yeah, this is, if you have that, you, you, you feel that you're almost immortal. I mean, you can do anything you damn please, and that's not true. Any other? Uh, yeah. elements of corruption or collusion with the government that you come to mind or anything else you'd like to say? I think we spoke a lot about the, the collusion between the industry and the government. It seems to me it's what to do that is the difficult uh, perspective. And again, I, I, I guess I will repeat myself that citizens have to organize, especially those young women, women, they, 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 they give birth to the children and they are our first line of defense. If they give up, we are doomed. So they have, to, number one, they have to have the knowledge. And in my humble opinion, because of all this lengthy experience, I think the chemicals of the pharma, despite the fact they're secret, uh, very complicated names and nobody understands what they're doing, they are like another form of nuclear bomb. I mean, the nuclear bomb will blow you up in, in a split of a second. This stuff will do the same thing, but in 50 years, 100 years. And then the genetic part of our life changes. And just like we modify a corn, you modify a human being. So who wants to live in a kind of 1984? George Orwell's 1984. So with that, I think 